Welcome to Hope Church. We're so glad you're joining us today. If you're new here or would like to find out more about our church, visit us at hopekansas.church. We encourage you to enter into worship today. Whatever space you are in, make it a sacred space. We believe God has something unique to say to you, and our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before. Now, get ready for some heartfelt worship and a great message. Stand up with us, put your hands together. We're here to worship the King this morning, amen. Lift up your voices and lift up your praise. Join with the heavens declaring the wonders of His faithfulness forever. Amen. Sing of the victory, the hope of the world. The Spirit is sending, the Spirit has come to bring us into life. darkness and into the light. The sons and the daughters are loved at a price. Our God has made us forever. Sing it out, church. We are the people of God with the free. The price. This is love. This is love. Amen. And when a father calls us soul, and we see him on the throne, hear the voices sing as one. Oh, 
Jesus, we thank you for your love. God, we thank you for your goodness, for your greatness, Lord. God, we thank you. We look and see of your goodness and we celebrate your resurrection and the life that you bring to us.
of this moment I I think of the the scriptures as I was just worshiping I'm thinking of the scriptures where Jesus literally said to the disciples it's going to get tough and then he figuratively speaks of the moment we just talked about unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood you cannot be my disciples he's talking about redemption at that point it says many of the disciples of his disciples there was more than just 12 Many turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, are you going to leave? Is this too tough? If this is what it takes, are you going to leave? And Peter said to him, Lord, to whom would we go? 
you have the words that give eternal life. And we believe and we know you are the Holy One of God. Where else can we go? He is the Redeemer. He's the Redeemer. No matter how hard it gets, no matter what this life may throw at you, there's nowhere else to go. He is our hope. He's our eternal God. He's chose us. And Peter said, look, I, I was just a fisherman and look at me now. I just a guy that smelled like fish and had nets all around me. And look, I'm standing with you. And we've come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Doesn't matter where you've come from, doesn't matter what your past looks like, doesn't matter what name is attached to your past, the name attached to your present is the Lord Jesus Christ. The name attached to your future is the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? Where else can you go? That's the name attached to you. You're redeemed. You're set free. You know, I know that I have things happen throughout the week, and sometimes I know that People look at things and they go, how, how do you get an illustration out of that? But I just, I, I saw something the other night. I know some of you aren't, could care less about football. Forgive me. I like football, okay? So I flipped on the, the, the NFL draft and I'm watching the draft. And the quarterback from Alabama, they thought he might go number three and he didn't. And he just sat there. His name is Mac Jones. And at the 15th pick, Eddie, who, who took him? You remember? The New England Patriots. There you go. At the 15th pick, the New England Patriots picked him. He almost ran down the runway. In fact, the commentator made the comment. Anybody watch it? The guy, the sports announcer made this comment. It's almost like he's running. He's so excited that he got picked. And he, he just, he took off. He didn't talk to anybody. He just took off. He was so excited. And he grabbed the hat and he hugged the commissioner. And then they interviewed him. And the person interviewing him wanted him to talk about how bitter it felt to have fallen in the draft. And here's what he said. They go, they go does it bother you that you thought you might go earlier, but you went 15? He said, here's what my coach told me in college. It doesn't matter when or who. It just matters that you got drafted. It just matters that you got chosen. And he said, I'm just glad I got chosen. So I say to you today, when I saw that, I went, yes, Lord, let us run to you and quit worrying about who else and who else and who else and just go, God, it feels so good to be chosen by you. Where else can we go? Chosen by him. Because the enemy says to us, oh, didn't you see so-and-so? And didn't you? And you go, no, I was just chosen by God, selected by him. Father, we thank you today that Jesus, you chose us. You did a work in us. You made us new today. We're so grateful for that. So grateful that we could call you our Lord and Master. Thank you for taking us out of our, our lost condition and making us new in you. We praise you, Lord. We've set up a simple way for you to give to our church online. If you want to give a quick gift, enter an amount, Select a fund, then enter your email address and your first and last name. Then enter your payment details and click Give. And that's it! We'll send a receipt to your email address. To use a saved payment method or manage a recurring donation, you'll want to log in. Click the Login button and we'll send a code to your phone or email account. Verify the code and you're in! Now your payment info is ready to go when you want to make a donation. To manage your giving details, switch over to the My Giving page. Here you'll see more ways you can give. You can also add a payment method, a bank account or a debit card, set up a recurring donation, and view your giving history.
Good morning, Hope Church. Happy Mother's Day. We are so glad that you're joining us this morning. Um, I'm Beth Massey, Pastor Bobby's wife, and I have the honor of speaking to you all this morning. Um, I've been a mom for nearly 35 years, and like all of you mothers, you've been through lots of seasons of motherhood. Of course, the baby, that sweet but exhausting time that you have. Um, from our, this is a picture of our family, and from my oldest to my youngest is 18 years. Um, it does get easier when you have multiple children because you have them to help out. Um, but the blessing, that is the blessing of having a large family with younger children and older children. Um, when you get into the mixed stages, when you have all different stages, um, during that season of life, I homeschooled for 25 years, and I definitely will never regret the time that I spent teaching my kids at home. I learned so much, and it fostered an environment of togetherness. It created childhood memories and um, a culture of your siblings being your best friends. During this time, I enjoyed the joy of seeing my children grow and develop right there under my feet. And um, to see them blossoming, blossoming and maturing. And then you have that season of teenagers. And to be honest, um, even though the teen years could be challenging, I don't have horror stories to tell you about my child, ch children's uh, great rebellions. No, I, I really am blessed by most of, of, of that, those years. Um, now I have a lot of adult children. All of my children are adults except for one, and my youngest is 17. And that season is easier, but it's harder. I don't really know how else to say it, but when your kids go and build your, their own lives, as a parent, when you see them struggle, you can't just gather them up on your lap anymore and um, hug them and pray that Jesus would take away that owie or whatever it is. It just gets more complicated. And then, of course, having grandchildren. I love having them in my home, interacting, and just seeing them and enjoying each other. I want my grandkids to be best friends and have a blast playing together, and they do. I've really enjoyed homeschooling my uh, granddaughter this year. Um, my prayer has always been for my kids is that they're going to make an impact on the world, that they'll be a reflection of Jesus to their generation and just in their everyday lives. And also, I've always wanted to be a mom who encouraged other moms in, in their years of parenting, um, especially in the years I was totally immersed in raising children. Having a vision of what God wants for us as moms, realizing the great task of raising children that will make a difference in the kingdom, trusting God that he'll use what you planted within them and they'll follow his plans. Recently, though, in the past uh, few months, it seems like a lot of crises have entered into my life. Um, all of them, as I sat and thought about them in the last couple of weeks, were directly related to motherhood. And that's a very ironic. Um, the first thing was my own health scare that I had in December. Um, it was with the very sacred life-giving organs that I have within my own body, the organs that grew and nurtured my children before their birth, those parts that regulate your balance as a woman. Um, thankfully, um, it was a threat. At first, it was a threat of ovarian cancer. That's what the doctor thought I had. But thankfully, it was only uh, fibro fibroma on my ovary. But I had to have all of those organs removed. Removal of that was really bittersweet because that was what nurtured and carried my babies, each one of them. Um, I'm thankful that I said yes to God for all of those children and that I allowed him to add children to our family as he saw fit. Um, I can't imagine our family without even one of our kids. I don't want to imagine what it would be like. They each have their place and their role within the culture of our family, and each one of them is very valuable. When life is threatened and you have such a big surgery and recovery time, it forces a pause. It forces an inventory on life. I did evaluate where I am 
and how I want to, con to in continue to invest in my family. And it's really important to me that I have that investment in my children and my grandchildren. I was so blessed um, just a couple days before my surgery, uh, we celebrated Christmas with our family and my children and they were so sensitive to what was going on and they brought their instruments and we had a beautiful time of worship and prayer before that, before my surgery. And it was just life-giving to me to see my children giving back at that moment. It, during these moments, we have to realize that our time on earth is limited. Thankful, I was so thankful that this wasn't the end for me and I can continue to live life right now, but we're all temporary. But it's really valuable to take that inventory and take that pause. It's really important. The second crisis in my life uh, in the past few months was uh, just some health crises within a couple of my children. And seeing them go through that and seeing them um, suffer. And it's really difficult when I cannot fix things. But as a parent, we have to realize that we have to trust our adult children to God. We can't rescue them. We can be there. But, um, but as a mom, that does not feel like enough sometimes to me. I don't want my kids to go through crises. Um, the third thing is the biggest loss for me. And that is the illness and the loss of my mom. I want to give you a little bit about our childhood and our family. The Tweet family. Isn't that a great name? It wasn't so great when I was growing up. It was a very source of teasing, but um, I've grown to love that last name. Um, I am the oldest of six kids, and here I am. I was the only child, if you see this slide, for five years. Um, I had the advantage of having my parents during that season to myself, but I always wanted siblings. So there's another couple other pictures here. Here's me and my mom, and here's my mom. That's at Friends University. Um, I'm certain she made that dress for me. And um, there's one more picture of her and I. And this is when we were in Seattle. Um, I believe this is when we were in Seattle. There was a pond by where we lived. My dad um, took a field trip through Boeing to Seattle, Washington. And it was when I was four and I turned five during that time. And um, that's where we adopted my brother, Nathan. And... Um, God opened that opportunity for my parents. And then after that, my brother Thad was born. And Thad passed away from cancer around three years ago. He was born nine months later than my brother Nathan. And then my sisters, my twin sisters came along uh, a few years later. And you cannot even imagine how happy this little girl was at 11 and a half to finally have two sisters. Two, it was a double bonus. And then, uh, of course, my brother Seth was born when I was 14, and he is a joy too. So go on to the next picture. This is our family um, with all the children added to it. It's a very sweet picture outside my grandparents' house. Um, but our parents raised us in church. There's my daddy. He was a pastor, and uh, we were at church all the time. Um, Wednesday, missionettes, Royal Rangers, various activities. My dad was a bivocational pastor, and he worked full-time and pastored. Um, he was gone a lot because of all the responsibilities he had. And I wouldn't say we grew up in the perfect home, but um, because we didn't, and most likely you didn't either. But God was good, and we learned to love Jesus at a young age. I always had a tender heart towards the Lord. I always wanted to serve Jesus. One of the things I always appreciated about my mom when I was growing up was her ability to teach. I loved it when she taught my Sunday school class. I saw a side of her that I didn't always see at home um, in her day-to-day -day life. She came alive when she would tell us stories and she would sing songs with us. Um, she wanted us to see Jesus and she wanted us to be able to respond to him she was a good example to me, and I took notes in those moments, and I started teaching my own Sunday school class when I was um, very young. The thing is, my mom wasn't raised in a strong Christian home, 
My grandparents, who I love and respect dearly and admire them, were not the ones to take their kids to church every Sunday. Um, Even though my mom begged them to take her to church, it seemed to really, she seemed a little bit extreme to my grandparents. um, And they went to a mainline denominational church occasionally, but Jesus wasn't what they centered their lives around. In contrast, my mom was compelled. She was driven to find more and more out, more about Jesus. When she was in the fifth grade, she got one of those little Gideon Bibles and she signed the line in there that she wanted to be a Christian. Um, Later on in her life, when she was around 16, she got involved in a Pentecostal church and it dramatically changed her life. And it made, it changed the trajectory for my life because it made it so we were raised in a home that pointed to Jesus. Over her, the years of her life, she filled her um, schedule with prayer meetings and women's aglow meetings and being with her other Christian friend, lady friends. She lived a life full of energy and she never met a stranger and she was eager to talk to anyone or anything. If you knew my mom, you would know that to be true. Mom was my biggest cheerleader. She loved, and it probably drove people crazy, she loved telling people she was Beth Massey's mom. When my mom was diagnosed with cancer in early December, I was um, taking her to her appointments. I was spending time with her, and I was hopeful And she was hopeful. We were all hopeful that she was going to beat this. She was planning on living a lot more years. Just two to three weeks after her diagnosis, my own health crisis arose. And my sister and brother Seth did a lot of the heavy lifting um, of taking care of my parents, especially my mom. She had hospital stays. Ambulance rides without red light and siren, much to her dismay. She wanted to have the red light and siren. Um, She had falls at home um, and various other things. Um, She was declining right before our eyes. The woman who never stopped moving or talking, regardless of health issues, she had endured her knees being replaced twice. She had um, back surgeries and shoulder surgeries and wrist surgeries other miscellaneous things. She just kept going. That walker of hers had gone everywhere with all her stuff in the front basket, and she was always serving someone. She loved picking up mail for a friend, leading her Women's Aglow chapter, substitute taught until her 80th birthday. She had to be one of the oldest substitute teachers in the Wichita School District ever. But now we were spending hours managing crises and spending days in the hospital with her in spite of COVID restrictions. One beautiful thing I was noticing was a fresh love and tenderness between my parents. It was beautiful to watch my dad lay his hands on my mom and pray for her. Let's go to the next picture of of our family. This was our family three years ago. Um, The past few months of my mom's illness seemed to drag by and speed by at the same time. All of my siblings, except for my brother Thad, of course, who was already in heaven, gathered at my parents' house for the last two and a half weeks of her life. It was a beautiful time to be together. And my grandchildren, her grandchildren were hanging out too at different houses, which was a true gift. We served and cared for our parents in a way that we never had before. Honestly, the moments were sacred. Watching my mom interact with the endless stream of friends who dropped by, seeing her and dad find a new love for each other, And enjoying the moments of all of us five kids together. We won't pass that way again. 
It was a span of time I will always cherish. Heaven is a real place. And being present at the moment your mom takes her last breath is a sacred moment. She was there for my first breath. And it seemed fitting that I, along with my sister Sarah, were there for her final. One can only imagine that transitional moment. Leaving your earthly body to step into the presence of Jesus. Her new home with a healthy body. It's our blessed hope. Knowing that we have a new reality and a new dimension when we arrive in heaven, my mom was, and I'm sure she still is, a social butterfly. And one can only imagine her excitement to see Jesus most of all, but the ones that she loved here on earth. And I'm sure she has made hundreds of new friends by now. So finally, what is the takeaway of this morning with my little story time I have taken you on? Mom's legacy is a conduit in my life and many others. Her life tells a story and leaves a legacy that to be passed on. If you knew anything about my mom, you knew she was a collector. She liked stuff. Um, if you look around her house, you would see a lot of things that she was collecting. But as I have been thinking about three of her main things that she collected, I was beginning to think about the spiritual significance of each one of these things. When my mom was a Girl Scout um, in her teens, which was, uh, she had the Girl Scout name. When you go to camp, you'd pick a name. And her name was Little Turtle, and later it just pared down to just Turtle. She loved turtles. And her Girl Scout, the weeks that she spent at Girl Scout camp were some of the most formative times in her life. She was recalling many of those memories, even in her last days, and enjoying um, memories from camp. But the turtle was something that she collected, literally hundreds of turtles, she even had um, two red sliders that she had got as babies, and she had raised them and enjoyed those red slider turtles. And we recently, thankfully, found a new home for them. Every person who came to visit my mom during her final weeks was encouraged to take a turtle home with them. Her turtle collection is spread all over the place to so many people who loved her. My mom was not like a turtle. A turtle is slow. She was the opposite. She was always going, moving, chattering about something. But if you look deeper into the characteristics of a turtle, you might see some other attributes that she possessed. Perseverance and faithfulness. It may take a while, but not giving up and having a goal in mind. My mom was always looking forward to the next thing. Committing to something and staying faithful to things that she was involved in. I love Hebrews 10, 33, uh, or 10, 23 through 25. It says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Mom had trusted God her entire life to keep his promises. She was always serving and she never, ever, ever neglected church and being together with the body of Christ. My mom was trying to read the Bible through again this year. She was also during doing a Torah study that was supposed to take six years, but she was trying this year. Her goal was to complete six years worth of the Torah study in one year. Um, 
She was upset the last few weeks of her life because she was falling behind in her Bible reading. One of her biggest goals was to be back in church. COVID had stolen months of meeting together for my parents. She wanted to be able to be back worshiping with others. More than perseverance, though, I see her as a strong person and one that is has an encouragement to get to keep going. This is very interesting. The shell of a box turtle is so strong that it can readily support the weight of 200 times greater than its own. A man with proportionate supporting power could bear up under two large African elephants. That's how strong the shell of a turtle is. She was strong, all right, and she was stubborn, too. Also like a turtle, she, had the shell, she used a shell sometimes to hide her true emotions if she was struggling. She always wanted to come across as positive. Turtles are ones who hide in their shell when they sense danger or opposition. My mom did use that shell sometimes to keep those feelings hidden. And often I'm the same. I use the shell to protect, to protect myself from fear of what others might think or say to me. Or fear that I might let a feeling out. Or it might reflect bad on my faith or my family. You never get to lift the lid and see what's inside the turtle. If you do, it will kill the turtle. But we're not turtles. We do have a chance to open up in safe places and share our deepest fears and hurts with Jesus and people who we trust. We also need to be that person who can listen to the one who's hiding in that turtle shell and be a place that they can lift the lid and we can be Jesus to them, loving them in difficult times and ugly moments. I love Philippians 3.12. It says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things but if all, or that I've already reached perfection. But I press to possess that perfection for which Christ first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling me. I think of mom. She has persevered. She was strong. And she has finished the race. She persevered. She made it. The second thing that I think of my mom is, is this lighthouse right here. My mom also collected lighthouses. And what message does that actually convey? Lighthouses have always guided ships into harbors to, and that pose to be dangerous. Jesus is our light, and he's the one that's showing us the way and keep us safe. There's a lot of scriptures, and I'm just going to zip through them, about light. John 8, 12, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Matthew 5, 14, Jesus says that we are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Psalms 19, 106, or 119, 106. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Psalms 119, 130. The teaching of your word gives light so even the simple can understand. And I love this one that I found just yesterday. Job 12, 22. He uncovers mysteries hidden in darkness and he brings light to the deepest gloom. Jesus is one who brings the light. Even in depression or hard times, he brings that light. We are to be a light. Don't hide that light that Jesus has placed in you. My mom was really bold sometimes. Sometimes she was even a little bit too bold for me. She would just start talking about Jesus and her convictions to random people. And sometimes I would think, chill, mom, chill out. But who knows how those words may have worked 
on the heart of the person she was talking to, or even on uh, working on someone's heart even now, even after the fact. My mom was a light bearer. She knew where her light come from, came from, and she also knew how to pass it on to others. She inspires me to keep passing on that light. Being someone who shines a light in a very dark world. But she sit, didn't sit around looking at the darkness, complaining how bad everything was or it's going to be. Instead, we want to be people that be the light that takes down the darkness. Simply by listening to the Holy Spirit and doing what he puts in front of you. This other thing that symbolizes my mom is this tambourine. And this is a very old one that belonged to her. My mom loved music. She loved worshiping. She absolutely loved her Gaither Homecoming VHS and DVDs. She made sure she had them when she went to the hospital because it would set the tone of the room as she was recovering. Music has a healing effect. My mom loved to praise and worship. She taught herself to play the guitar after she got saved. She had taken piano lessons as a young child. And when she began to, became a Christian, she began to learn to play the accordion. And she began to uh, teach herself how to play by chords so that she could play for church. She played the piano for church for nearly 50 years. The tambourine was her musical instrument that she could take anywhere. And it was always in her bag. She was always careful to make sure it was okay for her to play it in the setting she was at. And if it was, she would play it with great enthusiasm. She never really taught me to play the piano. But that old upright piano that sat in our living room called to me. I sat on that bench for hours, picking out melodies, figuring out chords, and how everything went together. Watching her ignited my own heart for worship and it encouraged me to follow her and learn to play for Jesus. I started playing the piano for our kids' church when I was just 12 years old. My dad bought me a little organ to play along with my mom at church. And playing with her was very formative in my growth as a piano player. It was the building blocks for me to play for worship all these years later. She lived this verse in Psalms. It says, let the godly sing for joy to the Lord. It is fitting for the pure to praise him. Praise the Lord with melodies on the lyre. Make music for him on the ten-stringed harp. Sing a song of praise to him. Play skillfully on the harp and sing with joy. For the word of the Lord holds true and we can trust everything he does. He loves whatever is just and good. And the unfailing love of the Lord fills the earth. My heart of worship is rooted deeply from watching my own mom and listening her to, to play and sing. My piano studio where I've had countless, countless kids come in and sit on my benches is because she fostered a love of music in me. My desire to teach my children to love Jesus and others too is because I watched her do that over the years. You see, even with all of her faults, we all have them. Much of the person I am today is because of what my own mom planted within me. And it's just who she was in her everyday life. So the question I have that I have to ask myself on a daily basis is, what is the reflection I am planting in others? What am I planting in others that will carry on? After I'm gone, my mom is in heaven. She isn't where I can see her anymore. But her legacy carries on in me 
and in what I plant in my own children and grandchildren, what I pour into my piano students and the people that, that God places in my path, we all have to take our place and use what God has gained or what we have gained to pour into others. What parts of Jesus is within me? What parts of Jesus is within you that you're sharing with others? That is and what will be your legacy. You're living it out right now. It's my personal responsibility to listen to Jesus, to what he's telling me to do, and to act on it. Then my legacy will reflect on his goodness. And that's the only thing that really matters. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for your goodness and your kindness. We thank you for lives well lived. We thank you for your patience with us as parents and children and, and people that are serving you. God, would you help us to reflect your glory? Would you help us to be who you've called us to be? Would you help us to remember each moment what you've called us to do and to pass it on to others? Jesus, we thank you that you are so faithful to us. You're so faithful to bring us to points in our lives where we can reflect and we can see your hand holding us and bringing us along. You are so good to us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you would like to respond to today's service or would like prayer, email us at office at hopekansas.church. If you would like to find out more information about our church or want to catch up on past messages, visit our website at hopekansas.church. Have a great week.